Welcome to Life Happens, where Texans come to protect their legacy and prepare for the second half of life. Join your host, attorney Kim Hegwood with Hegwood Law Group and our weekly guest as we navigate the challenges that emerge as life happens. Now here's your host, Kim Hegwood. Good morning and welcome to Life Happens with me, Kim Hegwood, and our very special guest today, Irene Francis Olson, who's an author and has authored a couple of books. And um, we're going to talk about baby boomers and more. And so, and uh, so, how are you today? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. I love that I can be on the West Coast and you're not, and we can still get together. Thank goodness for that. Yes, yes, always a good thing. So today we're going to talk about uh, kind of a little different title. No one is perfect, and that uh, perfection is highly overrated. And, um, and so, and I think a lot of people miss that sometimes when um, you know when they're doing things that, uh, that you know think that things need to be perfect. And so, uh, so let's talk about today. Let's just kind of you know dive right in. And um, can you talk to our listeners about? Um, you know, about your experiences, the type of dementia caregiving role that that you maintained, you know, with your father, because I think it's important for, you know, a lot of my uh, a lot of my parents, children who don't live close. Right. Well, I was Kim, I was a long distance caregiver. So my father, fortunately, he lived in what is called a continuing care retirement community, CCRC. And so as his needs progressed, he could just move from one area of the campus to another. But that CCRC was in Southern Oregon and I'm in the Seattle, Washington area. And that sounds real close until it's not. (laughs) So as a long distance caregiver, um, I try it. It was it's if I wasn't there, it's on the phone. It's sending cards while he could still read etc. So some people have told me, oh, you're so lucky you were a long distance caregiver and you didn't have hands on. I agree. Hands on is one of the most difficult. But then every caregiving challenge has every caregiver journey is a challenge. So regardless of what you're doing, it's going to have its difficulties. That's why I realized later perfection is really highly overrated. You can't you can't get there. So try but don't, you know, give some self-compassion to yourself. (laughs) That I can appreciate. And so, but I think a lot of people feel guilty for being a long distance caregiver as well. Did you have that issue? Um, I, you know what, Kim, I really didn't. And I think the reason is because my background going into being a family member caregiver for my father was in the long-term care industry. And so I'd kind of seen it all. And I, I had the textbook knowledge, which isn't always applicable. <laughs> so I kind of knew what to expect. And I had counseled others in my job and saying, you know, you're, do, you're doing as well as you can. Um, I, I guess the only guilt would be that I didn't see him as often as, I, as he needed or as I wanted. Um, driving would have taken hours and hours and hours and hours. So at the time, uh, for example, Alaska Airlines uh, had really discount fares or Southwest. And so I just bought a whole bunch and set dates. And uh, I had to leave my job because it was just too intense to do loved one and everybody else. So uh, I just set dates. He didn't, he was a captive audience. So I just set dates and went there and saw him. Good, good. So what what would you say that your proudest moments were? Uh, My proudest moments were when I could really listen to what my father needed. Again, that textbook knowledge can just get in the way, right? So one one example is, you know, my whole family, uh, we were raised in the Catholic Church by my parents. My mom had died in 1994, and I started my caregiving experience with him in um, early 2000. Uh, Yeah, early 2000. And he was still a very dedicated Catholic Church member. And one time when I went to visit him, 
you know, and I had a car, I'd rented a car and he says, you know what, Irene? And I think some of your viewers will, will recognize this statement. I owe the church a confession. <laughs> and it didn't matter if I believed in the practice or was involved in that practice. It didn't matter. Um, it, I just said, dad, okay, let's go. So, you know, it was when they had open confession and he's on the altar and he's talking to the priest and I'm thinking, what the heck does he have to confess? But anyway, my wonderful dad, but just to do that and go along with it. And because it honored him, it ought for, in his eyes, it honored the church, et cetera. So that felt really, really the right decision to make for him instead of saying, well, dad, instead of that, let's do this, you know? So, uh, but I guess another thing I would always do, Kim, is weather permitting, get him out of the facility because he had a very limited scenery, very limited living area, and he loved it. And I would just take him to the same park every time, more or less he recognized it, but then in time he didn't. Uh, and just walk around, you know, putting my arm through his arm and helping him walk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he used to be a real exerciser. And so just to be able to honor that past and take him out in the fresh air. And Kim, the best time that that happened, it was Father's Day. And as it turns out, it was my last Father's Day with him. He died in October and this was June. And I took him there. And Kim, this just, this speaks to how important it is that if you have a kind word to say, to say it and not think it's nothing. Here I am, my dad is shuffling. He's just, you know, doesn't have very good balance. And I've got my arm on him. And this father and his young son came toward us on their bikes. They were being very cautious not to run into us. And as they got to us, Kim, they said, happy Father's Day, sir. And I just, it was like, it just meant the world to me. I didn't know it was going to be his last Father's Day, but that they reached, they obviously, maybe I look like my father, <laughs> or mother or father-daughter relationship. And I said to dad, I said, dad, that was so nice of them to say. And he didn't register what they said. And so I repeated it to him. And he said, it's Father's Day? And I said, yes, it is. And you're my daddy. Oh, that was a nice thing for them to say, you know, just to have a kind word. And so never a kind word is never wasted because it's been since 2007. And that's one of my fondest late memories with my father. That is a good memory. And so most definitely. Yeah. Did you find, you know, I noticed we kind of talk about, um, you know, mistakes, you know, that come, come up, you know, and, but I'm always one of those that I look at it a little differently. I look at everything as a learning experience. Yes. So, because you, I think mistakes comes from lack of knowledge. So if it's a learning experience, then I learned something. Um, so what kind of learning experiences did you have? And yeah, how you it many dementia caregivers have experienced, whether they're caring for a loved one or a client, um, you are going to get frustrated because of the disease. And most people who are familiar with d the dementia process know that the person that has a disease doesn't remember that they just asked that question. Uh, they don't remember that you just told them that we're going to go to lunch in a half hour. Because in his eyes, what is a half hour? What does that mean? If you say to a two-year-old, I'm not equating him to a child, but if you say to someone that doesn't understand the passing of time that we're going to eat in a half hour, it doesn't mean anything. So he was like, Irene, I think we should go to lunch. Well, Dad, um, it's not open yet. The dining room's not open yet. No, we should go to lunch. Okay, uh, Dad, we're going to go soon. Five minutes later. When are we going to lunch? So it just kept going and going and going. 
which is a very familiar scenario for people. And, and I, I raised my voice. How dare I be human? And I raised my voice and was like, Dad, I just told you we're going to go in a half hour because I was thinking textbook instead of love. And I felt guilty about that. We went to lunch. He was ready for a nap. I said, okay, Dad, I'll come back and, and, and we'll, we'll get together again this afternoon. He laid down for a nap. I went back to the, the memory care unit to, to meet up with him. And I said, Dad, I want to apologize. What are you apologizing for? I raised my voice when I saw you last because I was getting frustrated. You did? When did that happen? Well, you know, he didn't remember. And some people would say, Dad, ah, don't worry. He didn't remember. But the thing is, is it was appropriate for me to apologize because in the moment when I got angry, he could have sensed that anger. It doesn't matter that he forgot it. In that moment, that's what I was apologizing for, was that moment. So that was like, okay, that was a real aha moment for me. <laughs> and so in raising your voice, whether it's to a family member or, or someone else, doesn't usually work anyway, because it's there's no, there's, that's not communication, that's just noise. Yeah. Um, I guess another thing, this is going to seem so minor, but when I look back on it, I realize why I should have done the right thing. Here I am. I fly in from Seattle. Here I come to save the day. <laughs> and let's go out to dinner, Dad. I want to take him to dinner. And uh, he says, oh, good. Let's go to Dairy Queen. Are you familiar with Dairy Queen? Okay. Yes. Than McDonald's, it wouldn't matter. But anyway, let's go to Dairy Queen. But self righteously, and I said, Well, Dad, we can do better than that. And he says, Oh, okay. All right. Where are we going? I said, Oh, well, you said you like Sizzlers. It's hardly a step up. But anyway, so, okay. But then I, and we went to Sizzlers. But but, but what I realized is I asked him where he wanted to go. He said, Dairy Queen. I said, ah, we can do better than that. I think the reason why he said Dairy Queen is because probably facility took their, ki their, their, their groups there. He was familiar with the location. He was familiar with it. He wasn't, uh, he didn't, he felt safe in that environment, but I didn't. I used my head wrong. I should have used my heart <laughs> and, and said, yeah, let's go to Dairy Queen. Who cares if I eat Dairy Queen? If it makes him happy, right? So, so I felt, I mean, that doesn't sound like a big mistake, but it wasn't honoring what made him feel safe. And I was going with my agenda instead of an agenda that would have worked for him. And, and although this is just an isolated incident, um, other people might be thinking, oh yeah, I remember when. Maybe dad, the reason dad or mom wanted to do this is because they felt more comfortable doing that versus what I suggested. Well, you got to keep in mind that hindsight's twenty twenty. Oh, I know. I know. And, and Exactly. And, you know, you know, you do better when you know better. And so, but uh, it was a mistake I made, but it wasn't the end of, yeah. end of the world. So many things we think are so outrageous. And then when we reflect back, it's like, yeah, but I didn't die or he didn't die or whatever the case may be. It seemed more horrible in the moment. And, and it turns out it wasn't. So that's why perfection is highly overrated. Just it's okay to be relaxed. <laughs> yeah. So let's kind of switch gears a little bit because the distance, you know, you're in, you know, he was uh, in Southern Oregon, you're up in Washington state. How do you, how did you keep, um, you know, communications with the staff um, so that, you know, what kind of procedures did you put in place so that you were always informed? Right. A, lot, a lot of times the families are get frustrated because they're like, no one called me. You know, this occurred. No one called me. Why didn't anybody call me? Or they'll call and 
somebody may not have the answer for them and they may or may not get back to them, you know, so how, how did you successfully um, navigate? Well, I think the important aspect is whether you visit your loved one once a year or eight times a year is to be visible when you're there. Let's start with that. Be visible when you're there. And by that, I don't mean the squeaky wheel gets the grease because being a caregiver, being on staff is not an easy task. It wasn't then, and it certainly isn't now. So don't be the squeaky wheel, but be visible so that they know that you have eyes that are watching. Because not everything is great in, in facilities. Um, I used to be a long-term care ombudsman, and so I know, I'm very aware of that. But being visible and being respectful of the staff. So what I did when I knew I was going to visit, I made an appointment with the head, whatever, of that department. And she and I, Selena and I, got together every time I saw her. Um, and she knew to be prepared to give me more than just the phone updates. But that brings in mind the phone as well. And so I if I wasn't visiting, I would set up an appointment with her. I wouldn't demand that she talk to me, but I would set up an appointment with her and we would talk. We didn't have FaceTime or anything like that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I think it's just, it's being visible and it is an important thing so that you have relationship with the staff. Now, one of the stresses that came about because of the long distances, the only way I could communicate with my father was by phone if I wasn't there. Well, after a while, he didn't know how to use this. And, you know, I don't, he couldn't dial out and he couldn't answer it. So that got very frustrating to me. So one visit I went there, everybody has done this. One visit I went there, I got a piece of paper and I wrote in really big letters my phone number and my brother's phone number and my sister's phone number. See, Dad, there it is. It's it's right there. Instead of typed out, is it? It didn't matter. It wasn't. It didn't matter how big the font. He couldn't. He couldn't figure out how to use the phone anymore. So because I had an established relationship with the staff, I, I don't know how many other people they did this for, but they agreed to, I would call, they would use one of their portable phone things and bring it to dad. It was a huge facility, but I, I think if you just have the right relationships, they, they don't mind going out of their way for you. But, but you, couldn't do, you can't do that every week because that's not fair to the staff. Yeah. So I just increased my visits. You know, I was fortunate that I could do that, but I just increased my visits. And here's another pointer. Initially, I used to tell him, Dad, I'm going to be visiting you on March 15th. And my flight arrives at, and so that means you'll see me at approximately this time. That created all kinds of stress for him. When is it? When is Irene getting here? Is it March 15th yet? And, you know, he'd be bugging the staff. So, so they said, you don't need to tell them ahead of time that you're coming. Just come. So I did. I just arrived. You go, oh, Irene's here. <laughs> what a surprise. But I created all this stress that he was going to be anticipating my, my arrival. And again, just like time didn't make sense to him anymore, n n nor does the calendar. Yeah. So what type of support did you receive from others that was most helpful for you? You know, um, my brother who lives in Seattle and my sister who lives in California, they were so, they were so blessed that I could do what I did with my training, but also just that I made myself available. available. And so they were, I was among the very, I don't want to say very few, but sometimes few involved adult children caregivers who received a lot of support and very little criticism. Because it's really easy to be an armchair quarterback. Oh, oh yeah. 
you know, or an armchair psychologist or whatever, an armchair nurse or whatever the case may be. And they weren't, they didn't question it. You know, I kept them up to date. Um, there are a lot of caregivers that don't receive that support. And a lot of that is from their family because the other family members are feeling guilty and I know I could do that better. And, you know, but, but unless you're doing it, you don't, you, you aren't doing it better. Right. So, <laughs> so that kind of support was their encouragement. And my husband, I would come home from my trips and download, <laughs> Oh, I raised my voice and I feel so guilty and I'd be bawling, you know, it's like, so find your support, whether it's family or otherwise, find your support. And if they're truly supportive, they're going to be there for you. Um, I wish I had engaged in an Alzheimer's association support group or some sort of support group for caregivers. I did not. Uh, I think that is, extremely helpful and I highly recommend it. It's very I highly recommend it because when you go to those, you hear other people's stories and you go, oh, it's not just me. Yes. Oh, I'm not alone. Oh, I'm not the only one that got angry or oh, I'm not the only one that feels guilty or whatever the case may be. So uh, I strongly recommend involvement in that. So Irene, you have the website, uh, Baby Boomers and More. Yep, I do. Babyboomersandmore.com. And my email is, weirdly enough, boomer98053 at gmail.com. Uh, I've had this website since my father got, got diagnosed. And it's been many, many years that I've maintained it. In my early days, there's a lot of caregiving, I don't want to say advice, but caregiving content that'll help everybody feel they're not alone and that they're not the only one that made that mistake. Or and like you said, Kim, mistakes are really just learning opportunities. So no, if no one died in the process, consider yourself <laughs> a victor. So um, I, I have a lot of followers. Um, I usually, I don't, I only post something once a week. So people never have to worry about, oh, I don't want to be inundated with emails saying, here's yet another one. I'm not even going to read it. Um, just, you know, I'm one of the most transparent people out there. And and when I make a boo-boo, you'll hear about it. And when I have a success, you'll hear about that as well, because you got to celebrate every little victory. Because if you're just waiting for the biggies, they're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> All right. And so it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Thanks Thank so you. much. So, and look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you. This was enjoyable. Have Thank a good day, everyone. You as well. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Life Happens with Kim Hegwood. Be sure to tune in every Thursday at 10 a.m. wherever you listen to your podcast as we navigate through the challenges that emerge as life happens. The content of this podcast does not establish an attorney-client relationship or constitute attorney-client privilege, legal, medical, financial, or any other professional advice.